First of all, I want to thank everyone for their patience on Tuesday, both with the equipment issues that we ran into in lab, which um, apparently uh, those machines have been updated, um, so we should not have that issue again, knock on wood. Um, but also uh, with me watching the little ones, which proved to be a challenge. Uh, it, it's like, you know, it, it, it's like that, you know, if, if it was a video game, I found now that if this was a video game, teaching was a video game, just regular teaching is like the normal mode, whereas teaching while you're watching a two-year-old and a four-year-old is like expert mode, right? <laughs> it's like really hard. And unfortunately, there weren't any cheat codes that I knew about to, to make it easier. So I appreciate your patience with that. They were actually as good as I could expect them to be. It's just very, very trying. I think I needed to take a nap after that. Uh, but anyhow, we, we made it through. Um, okay, what I'd like to do today is take the exercise that we had and do it, and then go beyond it. So we're going to do it sort of as review, but then we're going to go beyond it sort of the next phase uh, of this. So let me pull up um, the last database that we had. Download what we're, where we last left off. Exercise was make a database change. And I might have been vague on the instructions. If I did, it wasn't on purpose, but I will say anytime you get vague instructions, that's very realistic because in the real world, you're not necessarily going to get things spelled out to you. The people make assumptions that you know that 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 are not always obvious. That's why if you ever have a question about something, you know, ask and talk and, and ask to double check and things like that. So in this case, what we were to do was create tables for course and section. Courses have a course ID, a course name and credit hours. Sections are for a specific course, have a section number, and the day hours that the course meets. And just to keep things simple, you can make that just one big string field rather than worrying about dates and times for this example. Then create a web page that shows the results of a query that looks up all sections of a course and are using, uh, using a course name. So I would type in database and it would show me everything that contains the word database intro to databases, web database integration, whatever. All right, the one thing that isn't listed here that some people picked up on and asked about, which was good, 
So there's, there's no mention of professors here, all right? Which, you know, there probably should be because the database that we had contained professors. So the first thing I would say about this is that's where, you know, you would look and say, well, what's the relationship between how do professors fit into this? All right, yes. Oh, no. Okay, just flexing, okay. All right, and I'm like an auctioneer, you know. Sometimes people don't, like, ask questions or answer questions, so any little movement I interpret that you want to uh, do that. So be very careful or, or you'll find that maybe you have purchased a, you know, something. I don't know what a string field is. A string field is just a text field. In other words, uh, if you look in the database, there's a date-time field. And actually, if you're going to do this, you would have you, the better use of this would be to use a date time field and a day of the week and all that. But that would be complicated. So I just said, just put in like a description. This means Saturdays at eight, just as a text. All right. So no mention of professors. Now, what do you think the professor? Let, let's draw a little ERD. All right. Right now, we have professors and divisions, and there is a one-to-many relationship going this way. What that means is one professor is associated with one division. You've got to read it going in both directions. So one of these is associated with one of these. And we do that by having a division ID here. All right. So the division ID and the professor points to the division here. One division, however, can have multiple professors. So that's what we already had. So now we're going to add courses and sections here. Courses, uh, sections are for a specific course and have a section number and days the course meets. Create a web page that shows the results of the query that shows all sections of a course using a course name. All right. What's the relationship between course and section? One to many. One to many. One to many going in which direction? Um, one course with many sections. Yeah. It would be like this. If you think about this here, this is tougher to think about because like these, like the courses that you're taking now, there probably only is one section. Maybe some of them there's multiple sections. But if you think back to like say CISS 121, the course is CISS 121. The section is an online section or one that meets Monday and Wednesday 9 to 11 or meets Tuesday and Thursday two to four, or whatever, all right? So one course can have many sections, but each section is only for one course. In other words, um, it's not like today in this classroom, we're going to have some people taking CISS 243 and some they're taking um, CISS 226, right? This section is just for one class, all right? Now, there's no mention of how the professor fits in. So how do you think the professor fits in? One professor can teach many courses. One professor can teach many courses. That's true. That's not what I need to. All right. <laughs> it's true, but does a professor teach a course or does a professor teach a section? Both. Well, both in a way. All right. And if that's the case, where do we want to establish a relationship? Well, professor's got section. Professor and section. Think back of CISS 121. There's a bunch of sections of it. There's probably 15 sections of it. Can you say there's one professor for CISS 121? No. All right. There is, however, one professor per section. So Gresh might teach the one that meets Wednesday, and uh, Langan might teach the one that meets Tuesday and Thursday, and I might teach the internet section or whatever. So the teacher has a relationship with section, and that's where 
a professor can teach multiple sections, one section now only has one professor. All right? So that's how we establish a relationship. Now, it was said that teacher professors teach courses as well, and that's true. But that's known as a derived relationship. If you want to see all the courses I teach, you find out all sections I teach, and then find out what course matches up with those sections. And that will tell you what courses I teach. All right? So we talked about this before. You don't have to implement every relationship in a database. All right? There are some relationships that are derived. All right? And in this case, the relationship between professor and course is derived by going through the section. I can list the, I don't know, this semester, it seems like 15 sections I teach. Seriously, seven sections that I teach, right? And from those, I can go and find out the six courses that I teach, all right? Because I have one course with two sections. All right, questions about this. Now, why would I not put simply a list of courses or sections in the division table? Oh, I'm sorry, in the professor table. I could simply put, have five slots for courses and put those in the professor table. Why is that not a good idea? It's like it changes. Yeah, what if I teach six? Right? What if, I, you know, this semester I teach seven sections. So if there was five slots in there, then I would get paid for two sections. And that wouldn't be good, right? I'd be out there, I'd be out in front of the classroom with a little picket sign or something like that. You know, normalize your database. Pay me what I get, you know, what I deserve or something like that. Also, I'm going to have a course and a section table. Why is that? Because some things don't depend on the specific section. CISS 121 is worth three credit hours, right? And if you didn't realize that, it is. It's worth three credit hours. Does it matter who's teaching CISS 121? If you, if you take it from Gretsch, you get three, but if you take it from Langdon, you get four. No. In other words, the number of credit hours is an attribute of the course. It only depends on what course you're taking. So it doesn't matter who teaches it, or put differently, it doesn't matter what the section is. The Monday-Wednesday section is three hours, just as the Tuesday-Thursday section is three hours, just as the internet section is, is three hours. So what we're looking for is dependencies. And if we were to put that in a section, we'd have a potential problem, right? Because what if that changed? What if all of a sudden CISS 121 was worth four credit hours? You'd have, to, you'd have to update every single section and you're liable to miss one. In which case, some poor people would be getting the wrong number of credit hours for the course that they're taking. So you put it where the attribute truly belongs. Again, this is normalization. I have a section, uh, a resource about normalization that you should review. All right, and I'll talk about normalization as we have these different database problems sort of informally. All right, um, but essentially all you're doing when you create, when you follow the normalization process is making sure you have identified all the entities and making sure the attributes are associated with the proper entity. Where would I store the course name? In the course table or the section table? In the course table, right? That almost like sounded like too obvious that it might have been a trick question, right? Where would I store the course name? Where would I store the date and time that the course meets? Section. The section, because that's not the same for all sections of a course, all right? Where would I store the professor that teaches? In the section, because that's, again, it's not the same for every section. All right, so therefore, yeah, it's not the same for every section of a course. Each course has one teacher. So with that in mind, let's go and create our database. So 
I'm going to go into my database. And I'm going to create two more tables. course ID. So the primary key is going to be a course ID. I'm going to make a course number. Course number is something like CISS 121, which is a text field. Credit hours, which is a number. And let's see what else we had. Course name, course name, I guess. Okay. The constraints for this. Well, you need all these for a course. You're not going to have simply a course without a number of credit hours, right? You're not going to have a course without a course number. You're not going to have a course without a course name. So I'm going to make all of these required fields. All right. The course number is unique, right, across the college. There's only one CISS 121. There's only one CISS 243. However, I'm not using that as a primary key. I'm using the auto number as a primary key. Just a decision I made because I like auto numbers. So what is it called when you have a field that could be the key, and but you don't use it as a key? A it's called a candidate key. All right. So what do we do with candidate keys? You could index them. Exactly. And what's more, I'm going to make an index on it that is allows no duplicates. Again, that way I couldn't put in two courses of CISS 121. If I simply indexed it, that's not enough because you can index either with duplicates or without duplicates. If I was doing an index, for example, of last name of professor, for example, um, I would do without, you know, with allowing duplicates because there could be two professors that have the same last name. But in the case of course number, I know the course number is unique, right? There's only one accounting 151. There's only one CISS 247. There's only one that has a given course number. So therefore, I want to make it unique. Remember, you want to apply all the constraints that you can in the database. <coughs> Because, because that will ensure they're enforced no matter what program tries to access them and tries to do anything with them. All right? So, I'm going to now go in and save this and create my section table. And I'm going to make the primary key section ID. I'm going to put a course ID in here. That's a number. That's going to end up being a foreign key. Right? Because the section needs to point to whatever course it belongs to. So whatever the ID of the course is, I need to put in uh, that with each section. I have to identify what course a section belongs to. So again, if you can remember what that looked like up there, it was one to many between 
course and section, where one course can have many sections, one section relates to one course, the foreign key is on the many side. So the sections can point to the one course to which they belong. I'm also going to have a, a, a faculty ID for the same reason. And that's a number. And then finally, I'm going to have times map. And this is what I mean by it being a string field, a short text field. Now, let's go and make the constraints here. Um, course number is required. So I'm going to make it required. Is a faculty ID required? Kind of. Right? In other words, when the semester is starting, there better be a teacher assigned each section. Right? So, yeah, eventually that's required. However, for example, the courses are out there for, for spring now. And for most of them, there probably is a faculty member assigned. But there may be some that the faculty member hasn't been assigned yet, simply because, you know, maybe we're going to have an adjunct teach it or... Maybe I'm going to see if one of my other classes is canceled, and if that class is canceled, I'll take this class, or whatever. So faculty ID, I'm not going to make required. In database term, this is, uh, this is called becoming mandatory, all right? Which means that at some point, yeah, you need that in there. But you might not need that in there from the time the thing is created. So I'm going to leave it as not required, which means I'm not going to enforce that constraint in the database. So I better have some other way of making sure I get all my courses staffed. All right. Um, any computer system has five components. All right. It has the hardware, the software, the data the people, and the procedures. Whereas the procedures are like the tasks that people do. All right? Like making a backup of your data might be a task. All right? Entering a new faculty person is a task. So there should be procedures, document procedures of how this happens. Like not anyone should be able to go and add a faculty person. It should be that, you know, when human resource director approves and says this faculty person is, is able to be added, then you can go and add them and assign them to a division. All right? So there should be rules about this. When it comes to data integrity, you can build many of the constraints into the database itself. But some of them, like this one, there better be some other way. There better be a procedure. Maybe the procedure says a week before the semester starts, each division administrator runs a printout to see if there's any courses that aren't assigned. And any courses not assigned will be emailed to the dean or to the pro uh, uh, program uh, directors or whatever. All right? So ideally, we want to build constraints in the database when that's possible. When it's not possible, though, there needs to be other ways to make sure. So a combination of software and procedures could pull a listing that could be manually reviewed and make sure that every course is assigned. That's sort of just something to keep in the back of your head um, of how that kind of thing is going to work. All right. So I'm now going to go and add my foreign keys. Because simply putting these fields in doesn't establish a relationship. I need to make them foreign keys. So, I already have division and faculty. I'm going to show section and course. And I'm going to associate a section with a course ID. And I'm going to click Enforce Referential Integrity. Finally, I'm going to click Faculty ID to Faculty ID, Enforce Referential Integrity, and hit Create. I 
talked about cascading briefly. Essentially what that means is when you <coughs> delete the parent, what do you do to the child? So if I delete a course, this course is no longer offered here, and I delete it. Should I keep that from happening if there are sections out there, or should I go out and delete all the sections? That's the question cascade delete related records is asking. Because I can't leave a section out there without a course. All right? So if there was a three sections for course one, if I try to delete course one, I have to do one of two things. I either have to delete all the sections that belong to that course, or I have to prohibit that deletion from happening. And that's what the cascade says. If I set it to cascade, it will go and remove all those sections. But I think what I want to do is restrict deletion. So if there's sections for a course, I don't want to be able to delete the course. All right? Because, you know, what happens to students that were enrolled in that section? And so on. So I'm going to allow that as not cascade. The opposite of cascade is called restrict. So let me go and enter a couple things in. I'll enter a couple of the courses, course number CISS2143, three credit hours, intro to database, CISS243, four credit hours, web, database, integration, CISS 121, three credit hours, microcomputer applications. And that'll be enough for now. Sometimes people ask me, <coughs> how much data do you need? Keep in mind, that when I am doing this in class, I do like the barest bones of data, right? Because I, you know, it's not worthwhile me sitting here talking and doing this. You should have enough data to test your stuff. So when, if you're doing a query, you should have things that match your query, things that don't match your query. Um, so how much, what you're testing determines how much data you should have. All right, I'm gonna go into section and I'm gonna create for course one, let's say it's taught by faculty ID 2 and meets Monday and Wednesday at 10 to 12. Course ID 1 also is taught by <coughs> faculty member 2 which meets Monday and Tuesday and Thursday, 2 to 4. Course ID 1 is also taught by faculty member 3. Uh, and it is online. Course number 2 is taught by faculty ID 1. And Tuesday and Thursday, 10, 15 to 12, 30. and so on. Now, remember, because the foreign key is established, I can't put in something here that isn't valid. So I can't put in course 33, because there is no course 33. Likewise, I can't put in faculty member 232, because there is no faculty member 232. Also, I can't delete a course because there's sections for that course. And the reason for that is I did not check the, the cascade delete. Now I have all the data. Let's go and create our query. All right, because what I want to be able to do is I want to put in an approximate course name and I want to put
pull up all the sections for the courses that that matches. So, we're going to go into Visual Studio. Open this guy. I still see people opening it wrong and getting weird errors. Remember, you're going to go open, website. You're going to navigate to where that website is, where that folder is. In my case, it's on the desktop and it's called college site. And I know that's the right folder because I can see app data and bin underneath that. I could also see web config if I look at it in Windows Explorer. Sometimes you have a folder inside a folder inside a folder. Remember, you want the folder that contains app data. All right. So if there was a folder over top of this, you wouldn't open it, the higher folder. You'd open the one that actually contains app data. All right. So I'm going to go and make a new one that says course search. I'm going to go and view Solution Explorer. And new file. I want it to be a web form. And I want it to use a master page. That's our only master page. And I want to hit cancel because I don't think I called it the right thing. I didn't. I called it default to. So change the name to course search. Select master. All righty. I'm going to go and edit the master page to include course search. I had the um, master page highlighted. You can't see a master page, so it's going to call the default page. And I go to course search, and there I am. All right. So now let's go and put the stuff actually in course search. So I'm going to add my stuff on this page. I want to do a name search. So I'm going to need a text box, a button. So once I enter the text box, it makes it so by pressing the button. I then want a grid view, and I want a data source. Because remember, there's always going to be a visual aspect of it and a data source. All right. Well, how the data in that visual control is going to be populated. So I'm going to go pin my toolbar up here. Put my text box and button. Just a reminder, I'm on my toes today. So I'm going to go and put give these meaningful names. But if I ever don't give these meaningful names, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't give meaningful names. All right. I'm going to call this text box text box search. Probably should have a label saying 
what you enter in there. Now I'm going to have my data source and my grid view. So I'm going to go into my data source. What connection am I using? I'm using the same connection string. Remember, for each database that you're connecting to within an app, you're going to have a single connection string. That way, if you need to change it, there's only one place to change it. So the very first thing that I created that involved a, a connection string, I created the connection string and stored it in the app settings, all right, uh, or I'm sorry, web config uh, file. For every subsequent one, I'm going to go and use the same connection string. So, yep, that's the connection string I want. And this should be very familiar for those of you that were in lab on Wednesday or Tuesday because it's just going to sit there and look at me. All right. I'm going to go and clobber it. It's weird. It isn't even using a lot of CPU time. I'm going to go throw it on my thumb drive. If you experience anything like this in the lab, let me know, because that had supposedly been taken care of. Um, it was not taken care of in this room, so I can understand why we still have the problem uh, in here but it should have been taken care of in there. I'm actually going to copy this, and then I'll try it once without rebooting, which will probably be futile, but why not give it a try? Thirty-two bytes per second. I could walk something <laughs> faster than that. It is amazing that, you know, well, no, this class, the videos are recorded right here in this room, but my Monday and Wednesday classes, um, I actually have to go and walk over a USB drive to where they record them, and then they put them on the drive, and I bring them back and post them to the web. It's like, it's 2018, and I'm still riding the sneaker net over to the UC building, or UP building. Exactly. It is funny how spoiled we've gotten with technology. Like, if you'd have brought me from my high school days uh, when I was first learning the program in 1976, let's say. I think that's when I first started. And I saw this, I'd be amazed. Wow, this is transferring 30 bytes per second? That much? Back in the old days of the Timex Sinclair computer where you actually saved your programs on a cassette player. And if you didn't have the volume, the right volume, it may or may not have saved. All right? These are all true stories, by the way.
right. So which class is this again? Oh yeah, web database integration. Let me try to get into Visual Studio and try it, and if not, I'll re we'll reboot. Still going to go in and open it, by the way, to make sure that that is correct. All right, so I go into my course search. Figure data source. Connection string, next. Check your messages, get a drink, use the bathroom. <laughs> Okay, we're going to go to lab and do this. Hopefully I won't have this problem in lab. 